In today's video, we're going to be going through and continuing with the main quest line featured in the Elder Scrolls IV, Oblivion. Last time, we found the secret hideout of the elusive Mythic Dawn cult. We saw Mankar Cameron escape with the Amulet of Kings, yet we were able to grab the Mysterium Xarxes. After bringing the Unholy Book back to Cloud Ruler Temple, we wandered around the wilds of Cyrodiil and found that numerous Oblivion gates had been opened up. We helped a small platoon of Imperial Legion officers close one just outside of Fort Such. From there, we spoke with Joffrey and traveled to the city of Bruma. Here, we tracked down two Mythic Dawn spies. It was through these spies that we found out that Mehrunes Dagon and the Mythic Dawn cult wished to open a great gate just outside the city of Bruma in hopes of sacking it and ultimately destroying Cloud Ruler Temple. Fast forward a little bit, Martin needed us to bring over a Daedric artifact in order to open up a portal leading to Mankar Cameron's paradise. After that was done, we received word that Bruma needed help closing an Oblivion Gate. We showed the guard as well as its captain how to do so, and now we continue off with trying to gather allies for Bruma. Popping open our map, we remember that Joffrey told us to go to pretty much every major institution within Cyrodiil and ask them for help. Among these institutions and factions are the cities, the guilds, and even asking for direct help from the Imperial Legion. Our first stop is the Imperial City Palace, as here we need to speak with High Chancellor Okado. Pretty much immediately upon our arrival, we were spotted and attacked by two undercover Mythic Dawn agents. It seems as though the cult is getting more and more aggressive, and it's getting a little more difficult to move around freely. After their defeat, we head inside of the Imperial Palace. Here we spot the High Chancellor wandering around the hallways, so we stop him and ask for his aid. From the blades! Did you say? Joffrey sent you? What's this about? Quickly now! We ask him if he can send any help to Bruma. This is terrible news. Under normal circumstances, I would dispatch a legion or two to Bruma immediately. But the circumstances are not normal, are they? I've been pleading for troops for Cyrodiil for weeks, but the generals assure me that the entire Imperial army is already fully committed. Besides, I'd have a full-scale political crisis on my hands if I tried to pull any troops out of the provinces. I'm sorry, but the cities of Cyrodiil will have to fend for themselves for the time being. Asking for help from the Imperial Legion proves out to be a bust. You would think that with the Emperor's life being threatened as such, however, this is more than likely due to the fact that Martin's identity and survival is still unknown to most of the Imperial population. Regardless, we pop open our map and fast travel over to the city of Kavach. To our surprise, even though Kavach is still a smoking pile of rubble, we can actually approach Savli and Mattias in Castle Kavach and ask him if there's any way he can send help. Good day. We ask for aid for Bruma. I have few enough men to spare, but you have more than earned our help. I will send what aid I can. Bruma must not share the fate of our city. Exiting the conversation, it's just really funny to think about how the destroyed city of Kavach can at least send one person, while the perfectly intact and practically flourishing capital of Cyrodiil can't even send over one Imperial Legion trooper. Important to note is that Savli and Mattias will only send help for Bruma if we have completed the quest Battle for Castle Kavach. Now, if you've watched some of my earlier videos on this channel, you'll know that one of my least favorite quests in this entire game is Ally for Bruma. To me, I find allies for Bruma incredibly repetitive, and even though it is optional, it's somewhat necessary to do. Pretty much every interaction with either the Count or Countess of each city goes as such. I used to admire you, but it turns out you're just a sinner like all the rest of us. With the talking down out of the way, we ask her for aid for Bruma. I would like to send help to Bruma, but I cannot risk weakening Anvil's defenses with that oblivion gate open outside the city. As it turns out, the remaining six major cities we have yet to go to have all had Oblivion Gates open up just outside of them, threatening the town's safety. 
The Count or Countess won't necessarily ask us to directly close them, yet it's hinted and highly implied that we must in order for anything to happen for Bruma. Essentially, Allies for Bruma is one continuous Oblivion Gate dungeon crawl quest. The formula for each city is the same, we ask for help, they say their city's threatened by a nearby Oblivion Gate, we must then charge over to the gate, go inside, fight the demonic Daedra present within it, find the Sigil Stone, pull it out, and then return back to said major city and ask again for help. My main gripe with it is that it's very tedious, yet there are quite a few pros to doing it. For starters, the Sigil Stones in of themselves are relatively valuable loot, not necessarily in the monetary way, but more so in the fact that they can apply an instant enchantment on any piece of weapon or armor. Also, the loot within the Oblivion worlds can be pretty valuable too, this time meant literally in the monetary sense. It certainly helps if you're a higher level, but the drops and caches that we find in each Oblivion world tend to have some very strong and powerful weapons and armor, among other things, that can be sold for quite a hefty amount of gold. And thirdly, the soldiers that get sent from the other cities will greatly benefit us down the road. For now, I won't say why, but if you do know, you'll completely understand where I'm coming from. On the same subject though, as mentioned before, Allies for Bruma is a completely optional quest to do. And in fact, there is technically a very efficient way of completing it. See, we must ask at least the other 8 major cities for help. And as it turns out, certain cities will send more help than others. The cities of Anvil, Shadenhall, and Coral will send 2 soldiers. Meanwhile, the cities of Breville, Leowin, Skingrad, and and Kvach will only send one. So considered one of the more efficient ways of doing this quest, it would be best to just go to the cities that supply two soldiers, closing their oblivion gates, and then asking them for help while neglecting Breville, Leowin, and Skingrad. If you completed battle for Castle Kvach, then the obvious thing to do would still be going to Savlian Mattias and asking him for his one soldier, as the hard work was already done. Now, if there was to be only one city in which I would recommend closing their oblivion gate, and going through the whole process for, it would be the city of Shadenhall. There are a few reasons why. First of all, this is one of the few cities that sends two soldiers over. Secondly, and most importantly, the Shadenhall Gate actually has its own side quest tied to it. It's called the Wayward Knight, and although it's a little more tricky and tedious to go through than the others, if completed successfully, you get the choice of picking one of two unique and leveled weapons. Then thirdly, and perhaps the least known reason, if we haven't already started or completed the side quest, corrupt and Conscience, which takes place in the city of Shadenhall and deals with the guard captain Ulrich Leland, then upon completing the Wayward Knight and asking for aid, Count Andal Indaris actually sends Ulrich Leland along with one Shadenhall soldier. What makes this interesting is that Ulrich Leland is actually considered essential up until the start of Corruption and Conscience. So that means for a certain event that is yet to happen and that we won't discuss right now, Ulrich Leland cannot die and can only be knocked unconscious, leading him to be very valuable for what's to come. Now each of the six different Oblivion Gates outside of the cities will lead us to different random Oblivion worlds. There are seven different Oblivion worlds. The Anvil Gate leads us to World 7, the Breville Gate leads us to World 1, Shadenall has its own specific gate because it deals with the Wayward Knight, the Coral Gate leads us to World 2, the Leowin Gate leads us to World 3, and the Skingrad Gate leads us to World 4. Each world has its own quirks, and some I would certainly deem as more difficult to navigate through than others. As per always, it's best to come prepared with health potions, repair hammers, and soul gems, and if possible, try to approach with a follower. Eventually, we make it to the Sigilum Sanguis, approach the Sigil Stone, and pull it out. A few seconds go by, and the world lights up. Before we know it, we're teleported back to Cyrodiil. And at this point, we can return back to the main city's castle, which in this case would be Castle Anvil, approach the Count or Countess, and then let them know of our great deed. You sure gave those damn Daedra what for? It makes us all feel better to have someone like you around. We ask her again for aid for Bruma. I've heard that you've closed the Oblivion Gate outside Anvil. I honor you for your bravery and service to my city. With Anvil safe for the moment, I will send some of my best soldiers to bolster the Bruma garrison. And in most cases, we can ask further about the aid. Don't worry. Anvil soldiers are worth two from anywhere else. Bruma will not fall. 
As mentioned before, more or less, that's how every interaction with the Count or Countess in their city goes. Beyond that, we can't ask any other institution in Cyrodiil for help. There's no actual dialogue option to request aid from the guilds. Here's a compilation of the reaction from every Count or Countess when the Oblivion Gate has been closed and we ask for aid for Bruma. Your reputation precedes you, Hera of Kavach. You have done my city a great service by closing the Oblivion Gate. I will now gladly send soldiers to aid in the defense of Bruma. Consider it done. Thank you for closing the Oblivion Gate that was threatening Breville. I will send my guard captain, Viera Laris, to Bruma's aid. I believe that the Count may want to handle this matter personally. Wait here. I will tell the Count you are waiting to see him. Your bravery is the talk of Skingrad. Well done! Mehrun's Dagon has no more love for my kind than for my mortal subjects. Less, perhaps, as we make poor slaves. You have helped me by closing the Oblivion Gate near Skingrad. I will likewise help you by sending aid to Bruma. I will not forget your service to me and to Chadenhall. Rescuing my son from the Oblivion Gate was a daring feat. With the Oblivion Gate closed, I can now gladly send aid to Bruma. Well, with the Oblivion Gate near Leowen closed, I suppose the immediate threat is lessened. I will do as you ask. Let no one say Leowen did not do its part to uphold the Empire. Overall, Allies for Bruma can be considered a repetitive and tedious quest. Yet, in a lot of ways, it's necessary and very fulfilling to accomplish. With that, thus ends the quest, Allies for Bruma. Before setting out to each major city and asking for help, Joffrey also mentioned that Martin had made some progress on the Mysterium Xarxes. So with that in mind, we traveled back to Cloud Ruler Temple and entered inside. Here, we see Martin still studying away, likely sleepless and exhausted. We approach and speak with him. I figured out another item needed for the ritual, to open the portal to Cameron's Paradise. The second item is the counterpart to the first, the blood of a divine. This was a terrible puzzle to me. Unlike the Daedra Lords, the gods have no artifacts and do not physically manifest themselves in our world. How, then, to obtain the blood of a god? But Joffrey solved it. The blood of Tiber Septim himself, who became one of the divines. This is a secret remembered only by the blades, passed down from one Grand Master to the next. Joffrey should tell it to you himself. Exiting the conversation, we leave the temple and go back outside in search of Joffrey. We feel bad for interrupting him during his patrol, yet we need some answers, so we speak with him. So, Martin wants you to recover the armor of Tiber Septim. I wish there was another way. The armor is in the shrine of Tiber Septim, in the catacombs beneath the ruins of Sankator, a holy place once. But Sankator became evil long ago. No one has returned from the Shrine of Tiber Septim for many lifetimes. We ask what evil lurks in Sankator. I do not know. The catacombs of Sankator were sealed by the first Grand Master of the Blades. The four mightiest blades of Tiber Septim's day, Elaine, Valdemar, Relus, and Kaznar, went to Sankator and never returned. Here, this is the key to Sankator's outer door. I fear I am sending you to your death. But we have no other choice. You must succeed. We asked Joffrey about the armor of Tiber Septim. An ancient relic of the First Emperor, who became the Divine Talos, the patron of our order. After the Battle of Sankator, Tiber Septim gave his armor to the Blades in honor of our role in his victory. The Blades built a shrine in the catacombs of Sankator, on the spot where Tiber Septim received the blessing of Akatosh. The armor has been there ever since. Before evil came to Sankator, this shrine was a place of pilgrimage for all blades. But no one has visited the shrine and lived to tell the tale in centuries. 
Exiting the conversation, we pop open our map and see that Sankar Tor lies to the west. It's directly south of Hermaeus Mora Shrine and east of Cloudtop. Along the unmarked pathway to Hermaeus Mora Shrine, we discovered a gate to oblivion. This is our closest discovered location, so we figure it best to fast travel there and make our way southwest. After reading an article on the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages, there was a statement that Martin said that's actually false. He said that the Aedra don't physically manifest themselves within our world. But the whole Knights of the Nine DLC is centered around the Crusader's relics, which are Adric artifacts. However, for the game's sake, the DLC did come out after the main quest line was finished, so perhaps we could chalk it up to Martin not knowing about the Crusader's relics. But another potential Adric artifact is the Brush of True Paint, which is featured in the side quest A Brush with Death. Allegedly, the bristles of the brush were taken and woven from Debella's hair, so one wonders if that would have technically worked for this quest as well. Getting back to the task at hand, we arrive at the ruins of Sankar Tor. Purely based off of land alone, the ruins of Sankar Tor appear to be the largest that we've ever seen from an old fort. The exterior is littered with a diverse and powerful force of undead. We hack and slash our way through a small legion of skeletons and end up outside the front gates which lead deep into the abandoned ruins. Entering inside, we're immediately met with more undead. The first zone, simply titled Sankar Tor, is relatively small. It consists of two major rooms, connected to one another via bending pathways, which ultimately lead this zone to looking like a square. In total, we face five ethereal undead, so in our case, due to our level, it's mostly wraiths and gloom wraiths. In the second big room, we come across a rather unique looking enemy. Its nameplate deems it an undead blade, as it looks like a skeleton with some sort of smoky aroma around it, as well as it carries an Akaviri katana, a blade's helmet, and a blade's shield. The battle goes back and forth for quite some time. We were never really in any risk of dying, as the skeleton didn't hit very hard, yet it did have quite a lot of health. Eventually, we landed the finishing blow, and shortly thereafter, a rather unique NPC showed up. We spoke with the ghost. At long last, you have freed me. Now, I can finally complete my lord's last request. We ask who he is. I was Realus, loyal blade of Emperor Tiber Septim. I do not know how long I have been dead. It feels like an eternity. We then ask what happened to him. My three companions and I were sent here by the Emperor Tiber Septim to discover what had defiled the holy catacombs of Sankator. We did not know that the Underking, who was Zirin Artis, had risen to take his first revenge upon his former lord. The Underking defeated and ensnared us in his evil enchantment and bound us here to guard forever the defiled shrine of Tiber Septum. We then ask if the Underking is still here. No. He departed long ago. But his evil will remains, preventing any from paying homage at the shrine of Tiber Septum. Over the uncounted years of our slavery here, we have brooded over our defeat. I believe that we can undo the Underkin's evil magic. I go now to complete my duty to my lord, Tiber Septon. Free, my brothers, and together we may be able to lift the Underking's curse. Farewell. The ghost of Realist leaves, and with that we get a quest update. If the name Realist sounds familiar, that's because Joffrey had actually already told us the tale of these four blades. It looks like our immediate task is to go through the rest of Sankar Tor in search of the remaining three, 
and free them from their ethereal prison. The second zone we go into, and what acts as sort of the central hub, is called Sankar Tor Entry Hall. The Entry Hall holds access to five other zones, and within the Entry Hall, there's only two ethereal undead that we have to fight. We see Realist descending down the stairs towards the central doors. These doors look very unique, and it leads to a zone titled Sankar Tor Tomb of the Riemann Emperors. Entering inside, we look around and see sarcophagi on either side of us. Down the center is a small tunnel full of light and what looks like to be powerful wind. Approaching it, we begin to take damage and receive a quest update. The armor of Tiber Septum is on the other side, yet as it stands in these conditions, there's no way to reach it. Approaching the tombs and sarcophagi, they appear to belong to several of the Riemann who ruled Cyrodiil. However, beyond this point, there's nothing left for us to do in here right now, so we exit back out into the entry hall and begin to make the rounds. The next zone we go into is titled the Hall of Judgment. The Hall of Judgment consists of multiple winding pathways, along with one smaller room and one larger room. In total, we end up fighting eight different ethereal undead. Making it to the small room, we find the next undead blade wandering around. We engage in a fight and similar to Realis, this one doesn't hit us very hard but has quite a lot of health. Eventually, we deliver the final blow and a new ghost pops up. Have you seen Elaine or Valdemar? Realis fell in the lower chamber. We were separated. The fog blinded us. No, that was the dream. I am awake now. I must fulfill my oath to the Emperor before I can finally rest. Ending the conversation with Kasnar, all that remains is finding Valdemar and Elaine. We begin to backtrack and find ourselves on an upper level with some wraiths down below. After jumping down and defeating them, we follow the pathway which leads to the Sankar Tor Catacombs. Entering inside of this zone, we're fortunate enough that we immediately run into the next Undead Blade. If your level is low enough and you're still looking for new gear, each Undead Blade, after their defeat, drops a relatively unique piece. Relis holds the Amulet of Anse, Kasnar holds the Dai Katana, Mashahi's Cleaver, Valdemar holds Valdemar's Shield, and Elaine holds the Akaviri Katana, Northwind. After defeating this skeleton, we get a quest update that we only need to free one more. We see that this is the ghost of Elaine, and we try to speak with it. Stand aside in the name of Tiber Septim and the Blades. Hinder me at your peril. Definitely a lot less dialogue offered there, but now all we have to do is seek the skeleton of Valdemar. We once again retrace our steps and end up back at the entry hall. Our compass leads us to a door that goes to a brand new zone titled the Sankar Tor Prison. The prison contains mostly small pathways and corridors. Eventually, we get to a point where we see a lowly skeleton with the nameplate of Warden Kastov. Warden Kastov roughly has the same stats as a skeleton champion, and for us is wielding a Daedric mace. A fight breaks out and eventually we defeat it. Looting the warden's body, we see that it holds a key to the prison. Taking it, we're able to unlock the door right next to us, which is also secured with a hard lock. This little area contains multiple pathways that weave within each other, and at the end of most of these pathways contains cells which hold more ethereal undead. In total, not including Valdemar or Warden Kastov, we can face anywhere between five to seven enemies. Eventually, we get to a small open area, and at the end of a one small path, pathway, we see our final target. We engage in combat, and similar to the previous three fights, have very little difficulty with it. After delivering the killing blow, we get a quest update that it's time to return back to the zone Tomb of the Riemann Emperors. We quickly decide to speak with the ghost of Valdemar. I know you. You freed me. Free my brothers, if they are still enslaved. Together we will cleanse the shrine of the Underkings, foul magic. It would seem that the dialogue of each ghost is presented in no particular order. Valdemar begins making his way back to the entry hall and we follow suit. From the entry hall, we then go into the tomb of the Riemann Emperors.
the four blades successfully lift the evil enchantment left behind by Zirin Arctis. We're now free to go down the hall and reach the shrine of Talos. On the other side, we see an altar, and atop of it is the armor of Tiber Septim. Behind the armor of Tiber Septim is the tomb of Riemann III. We give it a quick read and then successfully secure the Adric artifact. Leaving the shrine, we return back to the four ghosts and speak with Valdemar one last time. We have fulfilled our last duty. We go now to Aetherius without shame. Farewell. Not only did we accomplish our task of receiving the armor of Tiber Septim, but we were also successful in helping to lift the curse of Zirin Arctis, turning this unholy place back into hallowed grounds. We exit the interior of Sankar Tor and fast travel over to Cloud Ruler Temple. Here we seek out Martin and present to him the Adric artifact. My progress on the Mysterium Xarxes is slow, I'm afraid. How goes your search for the armor of Tiber Septim? We tell him about the Curus of Talos. The septim blood may flow through my veins, but you have the soul of a hero. The armor of Tiber Septim himself. Joffrey will be amazed to see it. You can reassure Joffrey that I will not destroy the armor. All I need is a scraping of Talos's divine blood. The blades are as touchy as priests about relics of Tiber Septim, it seems. We ask what else we can do to help. While you were gone, I've made some progress in deciphering the Mysterium Xarxes ritual. The third item we need is a great Welkin stone. You may have run across lesser Welkin stones, they're fairly common in Aelid ruins, but a great Welkin stone will not be easy to come by. They have been plundered one by one over the years due to their great value to mages and occultists. There is only one place that is rumored to still contain one. The ruins of the Aelid city of Miskarkand, a place where many have perished seeking its great stone, but nothing else will do, so you must succeed where all others have failed. We ask him to tell us about Miskarkand, the capital of one of the ancient Aelid kingdoms which flourished in the Cyrodiil before the rise of men. It is said that the ruins are still haunted by the vengeful spirit of its last king. True or not, it is not a place to enter lightly. Be careful. We ask Martin about the Great Welkin Stone. The pinnacle of Aeliad magic. Once, every Aeliad city had its great stone, but they've all been plundered over the centuries. All but one. The Great Stone of Miskarkand is reputed still to shine in the deep darkness of its ruined halls. But no one has ever done more than glimpse it from a distance. It is said to be guarded by the ghost of the last king of Miskarkand. We ask further about Miskarkand. Miskarkand is one of the most extensive Aeliad ruins in Cyrodiil. It was the capital of one of the ancient Aeliad kingdoms. You might find glories and laments among the Aeliad ruins useful. I have the library's copy at my table if you need it. Exiting the conversation, we have the knowledge of the third and second last piece we need to open a portal to Mankar Cameron's paradise. With that, thus ends the quest, Blood of the Divines. Exiting the temple and looking at our map, we see that the Aelian ruin of Miskarkand is in between Kavach and Skingrad. Our nearest discovered location is the settlement of Shardrock, so we fast travel over there. Arriving, we head in the bearing of south-southwest. Although we are able to see the tips of the ruin from Shardrock, we make our way to the center of the pillars and enter inside. Miskarkand has three zones to it. The first one is simply titled Miskarkand. What's really unique about this ruin is the fact that there's actually a small war going on from within it. These ancient ruins not only hold a variety of undead, but they also lay home to the Bitterfish Goblin tribe. It seems as though the undead are disturbing the goblins, so the goblins are trying to fight back. And better yet, both the undead and the goblins don't like us being here at all. When the goblins are in the same room as the undead, the two factions will attack each other. However, when one side is claimed victorious, which usually happens to be the undead, we're the next target. According to several lore sources, the Bitterfish aren't actually a formal tribe of goblins. They don't have any war chiefs, and it's completely random if we encounter a shaman. They all do carry scales on them, so that's one common attribute they share, but also, unlike the rest of the formal goblin tribes, there's no totem staff for the Bitterfish. 
also something rather peculiar, it doesn't appear as though their level scales to ours. They remain lowly and weak, so it didn't take more than 3 hits to kill any one of them. The first zone for Miss Karkand has a total of 15 enemies in it. There are a total of 3 skeletons, 4 zombies, and 8 bitter fish goblins. The zone itself is relatively easy to navigate. Following the obvious pathways, there comes a bridge which its end is blocked by a gate. The gate is open remotely through a push plate. After it's been lifted, we gain access to the second zone, Miss Karkand Selvanua. Selvanua happens to be the biggest of the three zones. The very first room we enter contains three bitterfish goblins and three undead. By running around hectically across the room, we can aggro all of the enemies, which in turn will begin to fight each other. This, at the very least, takes care of how of our opponents. As soon as all the goblins were killed, the skeletons turned their attention towards us. Interesting to note as well is that even the undead enemies within Muskarkand are relatively easy to battle. We're a fairly high level, so I was expecting to fight skeleton champions. However, most of our foes happen to be skeleton heroes and even a few skeleton guardians. So in many ways, adventuring through Muskarkand is way easier than trying to close an oblivion gate. Selvanua contains 20 different enemies. There are 8 skeletons, 5 zombies, zombies, and 7 goblins. It doesn't take very long to move through the ruins, as again there are no intricate puzzles. Within no time we found ourselves outside the door of the third zone. The third zone, titled Sankertor Moramath, is the one that contains the Great Welkin Stone. Walking through the elevated platform, we can even see it in the distance. Moramath contains a total of 8 zombies. We're very lucky in that our primary weapon of Goldbrand happens to have a flame enchantment. Zombies have a pretty extreme adversity to fire, so we were able to cut them down in no time. We were also able to reach the pathway that leads to the Great Welkin Stone in relatively no time. Upon picking it up, we receive a quest update that we have to bring it back to Martin at Cloud Ruler Temple. We see that removing it must have triggered some sort of trap. Stairs from down below start to ascend up, two zombie guardians begin to make their way up them, and in the distance, we see a lich running over towards us. The lich is the king of Miskarkand. The zombies were no problem to take care of, but the king of Miskarkand proves to be a threat. He casts some very powerful shock spells that eat away at our health. He, in of himself, also happens to have a lot of health, and like most nether liches, he resists a lot of our magical effects. We're really lucky in that we were able to continuously stay dagger him. Through a lot of hacking and slashing, the King of Miskarkin fell. From here, we made our way back through the ruins, leaving the way we came in. Out here, we encountered more bitter fish goblins. We quickly dispatched them, but it's here we encountered a bit of a bug. It's happened to me before, but essentially, upon trying to fast travel or wait, the game says that we cannot as there's enemies nearby. However, no matter how far we end up going, we constantly receive the same message. So we ended up running all the way to the city of Kavach, entering inside of the chapel, sleeping, and then finally we were able to actually fast travel back to Cloud Ruler Temple. Making our way inside of the fortress, we walk in to see quite a strange sight. Martin is completely clad in heavy armor, and Joffrey is speaking with him in quite the serious tone. Sire, there must be another way. The risk is too great. I know the risk. I was at Kavach. But there is no other way. We have no choice. The Countess will never agree to it. She will. She must. Very well. The blades are, as always, at your disposal. Unsure what that conversation was about, we go up to Martin and present him with the Great Welkin Stone. You're back, and you've got the Great Stone. We tell him we said we'd get it. You did. I can count on you. We hand him over the stone. I never thought to see a Great Welkin Stone. As beautiful as all the old tales tell. But of course its beauty is a mask for its deadly power, like everything crafted by the Aeliads. Now, we need only one more item, and we'll be ready to open a portal to Manka Cameron's realm. We ask what the last item we need is. I should have seen it sooner. It's the counterpart to the Great Welkin Stone, just as the first two were the opposed powers of the Daedra and the Divines. Welkin stones contain the concentrated power of Mundus. Their counterparts are sigil stones, which are used to hold open oblivion gates. A great sigil stone, then, is what we require. We ask what the catch is. You're not going to like it. Geoffrey doesn't like it. 
The Countess of Bruma certainly isn't going to like it. Great sigil stones are the anchors of great gates, the kind of gate the mythic dawn opened at Kavach, the kind of gate the mythic dawn wants to open here to destroy Bruma. We ask if he means to let them open the gate. I said you weren't going to like it. The risk is great, I know. I was at Kavach. I saw the terrible power of the Daedric siege engine. But we have no choice. The only way to recover the Amulet of Kings is to allow the Mythic Dawn to proceed with their plan to attack Bruma. We say that at least he'll be safe here. No. I'll lead the defense of Bruma myself. If I am to be Emperor, it's time I started acting like one. We say that it's too risky and that we'll lead the battle. Remember when we first met in Kavach? I told you that I didn't want any part of the God's plan. I still don't know if there is a divine plan, but I've come to realize that it doesn't matter. What matters is that we act, that we do what's right when confronted with evil. That's what you did at Kavach. It wasn't the gods that saved us, it was you. Were you acting for the gods? I don't know. But now, it's my turn to act. We tell him as he commands. Please, my friend. I need your judgment, not your obedience. I explain myself to you so you understand me, and so you can explain to the Countess. I'm afraid she may take a bit more convincing than you. We say that we'll inform the Countess at once. Good. Have her meet me in the Chapel of Talos for a council of war. That seems a fitting place to make such desperate plans. With the Great Welkin Stone handed over, the last piece to the puzzle is a Great Sigil Stone. The only way we get that is by opening up the Great Gate to Oblivion. With that, thus ends the quest, Miss Karkand. We're tasked with going over to Bruma and informing the Countess of Martin's plan. We fast travel over to the castle and notice something pretty interesting. The courtyard contains a small encampment of soldiers from every major city in which we asked help from. We see a soldier from Kavach, Vera Lyris, Ulrich Leland from Shadenhall, a Skingrad soldier. Everybody's here to help and it would seem as though they arrived at just the right time. We head inside of the castle hall and see that Countess Narina Carvane is still here. We approach and speak with her. Greetings. What news from Cloud Ruler Temple? We tell her about Martin's battle plans. A desperate plan indeed. This... Prince? Emperor? Martin would risk my whole city to gain a great sigil stone? We tell her that it's necessary to recover the amulet. This is the only way to stop this invasion from oblivion? I must confess, you are the first person to speak of victory against these Daedra. This war has seemed hopeless to me. But what else was there to do but hold on and wait for a hero to arise to save us? And now it seems there is an heir to the throne after all, hidden at Cloud Ruler Temple. And perhaps a hero as well? We tell her that Martin waits for her at the chapel. You avoid answering my question. Very well. Don't think I doubt you. The rulers of Bruma have long had dealings with Cloud Ruler Temple. We know whom they serve. I will meet Martin at the chapel. When all is ready, I will order my men to stop closing the gates and prepare for battle. The conversation ends and the Countess rises. Her bodyguards escort her to the gates, and together we walk through the city of Bruma and enter inside of the Great Chapel of Talos. We see that Martin, Joffrey, and Boris have already arrived and are waiting around for the Countess. She approaches Martin and they begin to speak. Your Highness. I am Narina Carvain, Countess of Bruma, at your service. There is no need for any formality at this time. I am not Emperor yet, and I am quite new to this notion of being heir to the throne. Thank you for coming. I know I am asking for a great deal of trust, but this is the only way. I would not suggest it otherwise. Your champion has already explained the situation to me. I have agreed to it. We will not win this war through caution. You have a rare gift to know when desperation is the path of wisdom. I will do everything in my power to defend your city, my lady. If Bruma falls, the Empire falls with us. So be it. Before confirming with the Countess, we approach Martin. 
When you're ready for battle, the Countess will order her man to stop closing the gates outside the city. We decide to further question Martin's knowledge on Daedric magic. As a young man, I grew impatient with Mage's guild restrictions, as did many of my fellow apprentices. We threw ourselves into the riddles of Daedric magic. We hungered for forbidden secrets. Knowledge and power were our gods. You can guess the rest. We got in over our heads. People died. My friends died. I've put those days behind me, but the bitter wisdom that one has been a fool is not without value. We then ask Martin again about the battle plans. We must allow the Mythic Dawn to proceed with their plan to open three lesser gates outside Bruma. According to the plans you captured from those spies, they need three lesser gates open before they can open a great gate. The great gate will allow them to bring out the siege machine to blast the walls of Bruma, just like at Kavach. But it's our only hope to get the great sigil stone we need to complete the ritual. You'll have to act swiftly when the great gate opens. We exit our conversation with Martin and turn towards the Countess. I'm ready for battle when you are, champion. What say you? We tell her, let the battle begin. So be it. Bruma's fate is in the hands of the gods now. And yours. Bird, deploy the troops for battle. As you command, Countess. Together, our small band of the Hero of Kavach, the Emperor-to-be, the Blades, and the City Watch make our way into the streets of Bruma. Outside, the citizens are all gathered around, and they begin to deliver Martin a much-deserved applause. For the Emperor! For the Emperor! We reach the city gates and leave Bruma. Outside, we see the small battalion of soldiers we gathered lined up. As soon as we make it past them, we all begin to take the path northeast and see an oblivion gate on the horizon. Remember before how I mentioned it was in our best interest to complete allies for Bruma? Well, if we hadn't, or if we had simply decided not to close any of the city's oblivion gates in the stead of their guard, we would have received an NPC that's part of the Bruma militia. These NPCs are much inferior to any of the city guard, and for the battle that's about to happen, we need as much skill and force as we can muster. Arriving outside the first oblivion gate, we get a quest update reminding us that we must survive long enough for the great gate to open. Everybody arrives and lines up outside of the gate. It's here as well we get another quest update saying that Martin needs to be protected at all costs. Martin rushes in front of everybody and begins to deliver a speech. Soldiers of Cyrodiil, the Empire will stand or fall by what we do here today. Will we let the Daedra do to Bruma what they did to Kavach? Will we let them burn our homes? We will let them kill our families? No, we make our stand here today for the whole of Cyrodiil. We must hold fast until the hero of Kavach can destroy their great gate. We must kill whatever comes out of that gate. Soldiers of Cyrodiil, do you stand with me? Martin can barely finish his speech before the Daedra begin pressing the attack. The offense begins slowly. Daedra begin coming out of the portal one or two at a time. We decide to lead the charge and take majority of the aggro. The reason being is that Martin is no longer essential, meaning that if he dies, it's game over. Also, we're going to need all of the soldiers available for when the horde actually comes through. Before we know it, a second gate opens up, and at this point, Daedra are pouring out three at a time. It becomes difficult to juggle both gates, as when our attention is on one, Daedra begin to emerge from the other. It's an all-hands-on-deck matter now, and our main concern is finding Martin in the chaos and protecting him at all costs. Looking around, we begin to see the bodies of the dead watchmen piling up. All the meanwhile, it's getting more and more difficult to not accidentally hit one of them. As mentioned before, everybody is in a frenzy, and unless we're completely isolated with our target, the guards are more than likely going to catch a stray swing. Soon, a third oblivion gate opens up. We just have to withstand a little bit longer for the great gate to open. All the meanwhile, looking around, we notice that we don't have very many troops left alive. We continue 
continued to do what we can and press the attack, meeting the Daedra at the gates and periodically checking in on Martin. It gets to the point where there are more Daedra on the battlefield than there are Cyrodiilic soldiers. Hope is beginning to fade when all of a sudden, a flash of light happens and the great gate to oblivion appears. Daedra begin to pour out of it, and before we get overwhelmed, we enter inside of it. <laughs> 